Father, tonight as we are, I think, in the 10th night of our meetings, we need your presence to be with us, to guide us, to lead us. Lord, we're more than a third of the way through, approaching halfway through, and we need your presence to be with us just as much now as we did in the beginning. Please, Father, bless us now as we open your holy word. Give us wisdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message is entitled, Revelation's Battlefield. Revelation's Battlefield, an ominous and somewhat uh, curious title. So let's begin right away. We've already learned that according to the book of Revelation, the dividing issue at the end of time will be what, everyone? It will be worship. That will be the dividing issue at the end of time. Notice this. Revelation's Battlefield is the issue of worship. True biblical worship versus false man-made worship. Now, the importance of this cannot be overstated. In the book of Revelation, you will find that worship is the issue on which the whole controversy at the end of time hinges. Worship is the battlefield found in Revelation. In fact, to be honest, worship is the battlefield on which the entire controversy, the entire conflict between good and evil is fought throughout the length and breadth of Scripture. Think, for example, about Cain and Abel. The issue was worship. Cain brought his offering. Abel brought his. They both brought, this, they both brought an offering to the right God. They both were worshiping the right God, but one was worshiping in the right way and one was worshiping in the wrong way. So in the very beginning, the first murder that was committed, the first sin that was committed outside of Adam and Eve was the issue of worship. We come down to the time of the Israelites and Satan was perpetually trying to get the Israelites to, to go after the other gods, the gods of the Amorites or the Ammonites, the gods of the Moabites, to sacrifice their children and do all kinds of terrible things and always trying to lead them away into other kinds of worship. But if they stayed true to the worship of a the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was no danger of them being deceived. Can you say amen? So the issue has always been worship. Then we come to the time of the New Testament. And you can remember Satan there. And Jesus had been 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And Satan came to him in the midst of that experience. And he said, Cast the, or make these uh, stones into bread. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The second temptation takes him up on the pinnacle of a temple. Says, cast yourself down if you really are who you claim to be, the son of God. After all, isn't it written that he's not going to let you dash your foot against a stone? He said, ah, the problem with that, Satan, is, is that it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, the third time, Satan threw all the chips out on the table. The cards were down. The stops were all pulled out. And he said, how about this one? I'll give you all the world. I'll give you everything. Look at how beauty, beautiful it is. Look at its grandeur. Look at its sublimity. It's all yours on one condition. If you will, what was it, everyone? Do you remember? Bow down and do what? Worship me. So here again, we have the, the arch enemy Satan making the grandest of all blasphemies, asking the creator himself to bow down and worship him. In the time of the New Testament, the issue is worship. Will Christ be at the center of our worship or not? And so through the length and breadth of Scripture, worship is the issue. And when we come to the book of Revelation, we find that the battlefield on which the last day issue will be fought is, in fact, worship. In fact, notice this. The word worship occurs 24 times in the book of Revelation. Now, notice this. That is more than any other book in the entire Bible. Now, if I would have asked you, and in fact, even if you would have asked me, what book do you think contains the word worship more than any other book? I would have guessed the Psalms. Maybe you would have guessed the same thing. That would have been my guess. But, beloved, the point is, is that in the book of Revelation, that word occurs more often than any other book in the Bible. God is trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us it's important, and it is going to be the dividing issue, the fulcrum issue in the last days. Is this clear, do you think? Watch this as we continue. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3, we are told that all the world wandered after the beast. Once again, remember that Satan deceives the whole world. Think about the categoric language that John is using here. All the world wandered after the beast. He deceives all the world. So once again, we repeat, if we were to learn as Bible-believing Christians that in fact much of the world was being led astray and deceived, that should not come as a surprise to us. On the contrary, we would be surprised if it was not the case. Notice this in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. All will worship him. Whoa, but not all, John says. There will be some 
whose names are written in the book of life, these will worship Jesus Christ rather than the Antichrist. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. Let's look at a few more of these references. Revelation chapter 13. We want to take our time tonight as much as we are able to work methodically through the scriptures because tonight's message is a power-packed message. We're going to lay a little bit of foundational groundwork before we launch off. We're in Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. John says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his ten horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. This is the first beast of Revelation 13, of which there are two. We have already identified this first beast as the Roman church state, the ecclesiastical superstructure of Rome. Notice with me verse 4. The Bible says, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Notice the issue, the worship of the dragon, the worship of the beast. How about verse 8? That's the one on the screen. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jump down to verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth. Causes the what, everyone? The earth and those that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was Healed. Notice verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause. As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Again and again in Revelation chapter 13, as we are introduced to these two beasts, the first that rises up out of the sea, who we have identified, the second beast that rises up out of the earth, that as of yet is unidentified, the, the issue again and again recurring there in Revelation 13 is worship, worship, worship. These powers will be compelling and causing all the world to worship them. Now notice also Revelation chapter 14. This theme carries right into Revelation chapter 14. And notice with me verse 9. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand. That's the mark of the beast. How many of you have heard about the mark of the beast before? Let me tell you something right off. The mark of the beast is a worship issue. Notice how closely those two are intertwined there in verse 9. Let's read it again. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, verse 10, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Notice how closely intertwined the mark of the beast is on the forehead or on the hand in this issue of worship. So all throughout this end time chapter here, Revelation 13 or Revelation 14, we have this, this reverberating theme, worship of the beast, worship of the beast, worship of the beast, worship even of the dragon, worship, 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 a call to the entire world to come and worship the beast, worship the dragon. But in the middle of this, right in the very middle of this maelstrom of, of a call to worship, right in the midst of all of this activity, Notice this in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. John hears another call. And notice this call that he hears. Revelation 14 and verse 6. Then I heard another angel fly, or I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Those who dwell where, everybody? On the earth. Notice what it says. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So this is a message that goes to everyone. Now, the reason that the message has to go to everyone is that the beast has told everyone to worship him. And so God has to send out his own message, and he can't just send it to Grand Rapids. Can you say amen? I mean, this message has got to go everywhere. It's got to go to New Guinea, and it's got to go to Australia, and it's got to go to Europe, and it's got to go to Africa. It's got to go everywhere. Here is this message. It is a clarion call. And notice what the heart of the message is all about. Verse 7 says, saying with a loud voice. Apparently, it is important. In the Greek word, the Greek word there that is translated loud voice is megaphone. Megaphone. Isn't that interesting? A loud voice saying, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So notice that. Let us pick that apart a little bit. Let's not race by that verse 7 too quickly. It says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. The beast is saying, fear me. The beast is saying, if you don't receive the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your hand, you'll be killed. But here comes this different message, and it says, don't worry about the beast, fear God. 
Fear God and give glory to Him. Don't give glory to the beast. Give glory to God. For the hour of His judgment has come. The beast has no hour of judgment. He can't judge you. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him. Don't worship the beast. Worship God. Well, how are we going to worship this God? Notice what it says. Let's pick that apart. Verse 7 says, And worship Him who made. Who what, everyone? Who made. Say that with me. Worship Him who made 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 what made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of waters I suppose that in the midst of all of these calls to false worship there is a clarion call a distinct call a call that will be heard by all of God's people to worship God as the creator are you with me on that it's pretty simple really in other words if you say well I'm a worshiper of God which God the God of the frogs, the God of the dogs, the God of the pollywogs, the God of the hogs. I mean, that's the way the Egyptians were. They had a God for everything. How do we know which God we're worshiping? Well, you know what you and I can say? We can say, well, we worship the true God, the creator God. The one who in the beginning, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who created everything. That's the God I worship. Can you say amen? amen? That's incredible. Remember one day Moses was standing at a burning bush? And Moses, the burning bush, basically, the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush and said, go down there and get my people out of Egypt. Well, I'd love to do that, Lord, but they're going to wonder who sent me. Who shall I say sent me? You tell them I am that I am sent you. You see, there is a bunch of gods, little g, and then there is the God of heaven and earth. Can you say amen? And that's the true God. He's the creator God. He's the one that was in the beginning. He's the alpha and he's the omega. He is not affected by time. He is not subject to time. He is the God of all heaven and earth. Are you with me now? So in the midst of all these calls to false worship, right in the center of that, there's a call that says, nah, uh, 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 don't worship the Antichrist. Worship the creator God of heaven and earth. Now, if this makes sense, say amen. Okay, let's continue on then. As we continue, notice this. Jesus Christ said, we've been over this. All power, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. How many of you are with us tonight? We discussed, does Jesus Christ have a twin? And we put up those eight similarities between Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. You remember that? Do you remember it? Yeah. Now listen, one of the identifying uh, uh, the similarities, the counterfeit similarities, was that the Antichrist claims to have universal dominion and authority. And also Jesus Christ claims to have universal dominion and authority. And that's what he's saying here. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So at the end of time, listen very carefully, there's going to be two calls to worship and two claims on authority. One says, worship me. And the other says, no, worship me. One says, I have universal authority. And the other says, no, I have universal authority. And the entire world will be made to decide, am I going to worship this one or that one? Am I going to subject myself to the authority of this one or that one? By the way, there is no third party in the book of Revelation. There's no spectators group. You with me on that? It's not like a football game where you can be on team A or team B or in the stands. In this last conflagration, you will either be on team A or team B, and there is no third party. You're in one or the other. Jesus would put it this way. He'd say there's the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the saved and the lost. We will be in one party or the other. Now, I have made up my mind that I choose to worship Jesus Christ and stand under His authority. Have you made that de your decision? Let's continue. We discussed ten identifying characteristics that point unmistakably to who this anti-Christian power is. We've already been over these ten points in our message entitled The Antichrist Exposed. What we want to hone in on tonight is this one here. Number nine. One of the identifying characteristics of this power would be that he would think to change times and laws. Not the laws of Grand Rapids, not even the laws of Michigan or the United States, but the laws of God. That's why it's such a blasphemous thing. That's why it's such an incredible thing. He's thinking to change the very times, the very laws of the God of heaven. Now, we're going to hone in on that. Remember this verse of Scripture, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25? And he shall speak great words against the Most High. That's blasphemy. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's persecution. And think to change times and laws. Now, notice the importance of that word think. Can you actually change God's law, yes or no? No way. He wrote it with his own finger on tables of? Stone. And what did he do with those two Ten Commandments, the two tables? When it was done, they put it in a very special place. Where was that? The Ark of the Covenant. You've got it. 
So this power doesn't actually change God's law. That would be impossible. I mean, what you'd have to do is essentially ascend to heaven, take God off his throne, you know, and, and change the Ten Commandments. Impossible. Impossible. So this power doesn't actually do it. It just thinks to do it. Or as the New King James says, it intends to do it. Now, we, we note again an important statement. This one's taken from the Prompta Bibliotheca by Lucius Ferrari, an article entitled Papa. Volume 6, page 29. The Pope is of so great authority and power. Now, notice that word. I want you to hone in on that word right there. What word is that? Authority. Remember that word. Put it on a shelf in your mind. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even what kind of laws? Divine laws. Notice this. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as vicegerent or representative of God upon the earth. Now remember, there's going to be two calls to worship at the end of time and two claims on authority at the end of time. Now what we're going to find out at this point is very important. We are going to, right here, we have a launching pad that is firm. We know where we're standing. Revelation tells us worship is going to be the issue. We have been told that tradition not Scripture is the rock upon which the church of Jesus is built. We have been told that there is a man who has infallible authority to change even the very moral, holy law of God. With this platform, you are now prepared as an audience, and I am prepared as a speaker, to examine four or five, I forgot how many I put in there, but four or five of the most incredible claims that I have ever heard in my life. So put your seatbelt on. Do these seats have seatbelts? We're probably going to wish they did before the night is over. What we're going to do at this point is we are going to turn to the official writings of the Roman church state, and we are going to let them make some claims that are really going to be very disturbing to you. You're going to think to yourself, what? I never heard anything like that before in my life. This is crazy. Just sit tight. Because what we're going to do when that is done is we're going to take a look at the claims and see if they're true or if they're false. So buckle your seatbelt. Here we go. This is taken from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, written by the Reverend Peter Geierman, CSSR, on page 50. A catechism is usually done in a question and answer format. So here's the question. Number one, which is the Sabbath day? Here's the answer given in the catechism. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Here's the rejoinder, the question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Now notice very carefully this answer. This is what I want you to hone in on. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Hone in on that now. Which day is the Sabbath? Well, Saturday's the Sabbath. Well, why do we go to church on Sunday? Because the church changed it. Now, that's the claim. We're going to investigate that claim. Notice the second one. This one's taken from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 153. Notice. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Again, the church changed it. Statement number two. Let's notice yet another. The American Catholic Quarterly Review, January of 1883. Protestantism, in discarding the... What's that next word there? Authority of the church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday with the Jews. Notice the issue again is authority. We changed it. Now, let's think just for a moment that word authority. What is the root word of authority? Author. The one who legitimately has authority over us would be our author. Doesn't that make sense? Now, let's continue here. This one's from Canon and Tradition, page 263. The authority of the church. The what? The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures. You get that? Because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday. Notice what goes on. Not by a command of Christ, but by its own authority. Notice how often that word keeps coming up. Authority, authority, authority. Now let the significance of this sink into your mind. Four claims have just been made. I mean, these are incredible claims. It is probably no secret to you that the vast majority of people who profess Christianity go to church on what day of the week? Sunday. Now the claim, not being made by David Ashrick, this isn't my claim. I didn't write those books. The claim that is being made by the Roman church state is that the reason that they go is not because the Bible says so, but because we say so. Now, let's investigate that claim. Are they telling the truth? 
Our question tonight is, can Sunday observance be supported from the Bible, or is it merely a commandment of the Roman church state? Let's investigate their claim. Are they telling the truth? Did they change it? Or can we support it from the Bible? Well, remember that they're in the middle of all of those claims, all of those claims to worship the Antichrist, worship the Antichrist, the call, worship the Antichrist, worship the Antichrist. There was another call in there. Let me quote it for you. Remember Revelation 14, 6 and 7? Let me quote it for you. We've already read it this evening. John says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying, verse 7, with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Why? For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Worship Him that what, everyone? Made. In other words, worship the Creator. Well, I suppose if we're going to worship the Creator, we probably should understand what happened at creation. How does that sound? Let's go take a look. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis in the first chapter. Genesis chapter 1. We are investigating what I personally consider to be one of the grandest claims that I have ever personally heard. And that is this idea that the entire civilized world, the Western world, is bowing down in reverent obedience to the command of the ecclesiastical church state of Rome, not standing upon the authority of the word. That is a huge claim. We're going to see tonight if it has any validity. Notice with me Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. We've read parts of this before, but let's just pick up the last verse here. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was what, everyone? Very good. Not just pretty good, but very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Let's, let's understand this. In the beginning, God created. Now, I still believe that. Do you believe that? I just believe it. I don't buy this evolution stuff for a second. I believe that God created in six literal days. The first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And there is a volume of evidence out there to support a literal six-day creation. You don't have to worry about this idea of evolution. It is fiction, brothers and sisters. If you want to write down a book, write down this if you're interested. A little book called In Six Days. In Six Days. It's edited by a man named John F. Ashton. A-S-H-T-O-N. And it has 50 chapters... And every chapter is written by a different Ph.D. Did you hear what I said? A different Ph.D., a scientist, many of them the top scientists in their field, and the whole book is about them giving their reason for believing on a scientific level why they believe God created the earth in six days. Are you with me on that? An incredible book, In Six Days by John Ashton. Now notice he sees everything that he had made, and behold, it was what, everyone? Very good. Not just pretty good, not kind of good, not moderately good, but very good. Now we go into Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. What happened after God had created in six days? It says, And the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Were what? Finished. Say that with me. Were finished. Now I want you to take that word finished and put it on another shelf in your mind because we're going to come back to it. Finished is an important word. God had created everything. It was done. So what does he do now? Verse 2. And on the seventh day God ended his work in which he had done and he rested. What did he do? He rested, notice what it says, on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. God must have been tired. Right? God was exhausted from all that work of creation, right? God was just fatigued, sweated up a storm making all those various things. Is that right? Yes or no? It's not right, is it? Why did he rest on the seventh day? We're going to find out. But it was not because he was tired. I think God could have created the world in one nanosecond. He didn't need seven days. Can you say amen? He chose to do it in a very uh, important, precise, and methodical pattern. We're going to find out why he did that. But here's the point. God creates the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And when the entirety of creation is, what word? Finished. When it's finished, he then takes a rest. Now, let's talk about that for just a moment. Notice this. According to these verses of Scripture, the seventh day, number one, God blessed it. Number two, God sanctified it. And number three, God rested on it. Now, let's let something th sink into our minds here. Sin enters the Bible in which chapter? Genesis chapter what? Three. We're in Genesis chapter what? What did we just read from? Genesis Two. So in Genesis 1 and 2, is sin even a factor yet? Yes or no? There is no sin. 
There's just Adam and Eve, a perfect God and perfect communion with the perfect people. Sin is not even an issue yet. And God said, you know what, Adam and Eve, for your benefit, for your happiness, I'm going to give you two very important institutions. The first institution he gave them was the institution of marriage. Can you say amen? God said, Adam, basically, Adam, you're not going to make it on your own. You need a help meet. And when he saw Eve, right, this was very, he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So the first institution that was created was marriage. And that has to do with the horizontal relationship, my relationship to other human beings. The entire fabric of society is made up of the individual strength of the brick of the family. If the family is strong, society will be strong. Are you with me, yes or no? See, over here, there's a whole bunch of bricks. And if each of these bricks are strong, then the wall will be what? Strong. But if the bricks are weak, what will the wall be? Weak. And so God created in Eden the family unit. And if the family unit is strong, the nation will be strong. But he created something else. He said, you need more than just a horizontal relationship. You need a vertical relationship with me. And I'm going to give you an appointment with me every single week on the seventh day to come and visit with me. The horizontal, marriage. The vertical, the Sabbath. And both of these two institutions existed, listen to my words very carefully, before sin. Can you say amen? So you're in Genesis 2. Sin doesn't become a factor until Genesis 3 over here. So let us review. As we look at these verses, it is very simple. On the seventh day, God blessed it, God sanctified it, God rested on it. Let's look at verse, or number two there, God sanctified it. Now, who here knows what does that mean, God sanctified it? He set it apart. He made it holy. God alone can make something holy. You see this remote control? It's not real holy. Even if I try to make it holy, could I do that? Couldn't do it. Could God make it holy? Sure could. Only God can make things holy. You heard about holy water. There's no such thing as holy water unless God makes it holy. Now, God could take something and make it holy, but you and I do not have that prerogative, and God made the seventh day holy. Now, so far, this makes sense. Say amen. Okay, now we go from Eden to Mount Sinai. Go with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, we move forward almost 2,000 years into the future, Exodus in the 20th chapter. And here we find the children of Israel shivering and quaking in fear at the foot of a mountain. And the name of that mountain is Mount Sinai. And God has a plan. God is going to reveal to these stiff-necked, rebellious rogues just exactly what he is like. Remember what Moses said? I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God said, okay, I'll show you my glory on three occasions. Number one, you get in the cleft of the rock. Number two, I'm going to cover you with my hand. And number three, you can only see the back parts. He said, one more thing, Moses. I want you to go down the hill and get me two, what did he want? Tables of what, everyone? Stone. And when Moses came back up the mountain, God revealed his glory to him, and he wrote with his own finger on tables of stone. Now, who was it that wrote? It was God that wrote. What did he write? He wrote the Ten Commandments. Now, you're right there in Exodus chapter 20, and that is the Ten Commandments. Now, I personally believe that every Christian should have the Ten Commandments memorized. Make an effort of it. You should have them memorized. It's helpful to know what they are. Let's begin with the first commandment. Very simple. God simply said this, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. The second commandment, he said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, the earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. He said, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the, of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Second commandment, don't bow down to graven images. So far, so good. Third commandment, he says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless whosoever taketh his name in vain. Third commandment, don't take God's name in vain. Let's look at the fourth commandment. Now, you're there in your Bibles. In Exodus chapter 20, and notice with me verse 8, he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to do what? Keep it holy. Now, let's talk about that for just a moment. God says, Remember it to keep it holy. When was it made holy according to the Bible? It was made holy in Genesis, remember? He set it apart, and what did he do, beloved? He sanctified it. What does the word sanctify mean? It means to make it holy. So now God is reminding the children of Israel who had been in 400 years of abject slavery, he says, this is who I am. 
And he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9. How are we going to do that, God? How are we going to keep this day holy? This is how you do it. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Hey, that sounds like God, doesn't it? How many days did God work? Six, and he rested on the what? Seven. Now, God is telling us to do the same. Sounds like he wants us to, to imitate him. Now, God wasn't tired. Remember? God wasn't tired. He must have had a purpose. There must have been some wisdom in working for six and resting on the seven. Must have been something in that. I think God's reasonably intelligent. What do you think? That's probably an understatement, don't you think? And so God, we now find out, instituted this, not for his benefit, beloved, but for my benefit, for your benefit. Notice the rest of this. Verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Why should we obey this Sabbath, God? I'm going to tell you. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made, now listen carefully here, the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And what did he do? He hallowed it. You know what the word hallowed means? Same thing. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? We say, Our Father, which art in heaven, what do we say next? Hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? Holy is your name. Now keep your finger right there. You're in, you're in Exodus chapter 20. Just keep a look at verse 11. Remember this? For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Are you with me on that? Now keep your finger. If you have one of these fancy red ribbons, or mine happens to be black, whoosh, slide it right there and just go back quickly to Revelation chapter 14. Just very quickly. We've already quoted the scripture, but I want you to see the incredible similarity here. Revelation chapter 14, and we're reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Remember, this is in the middle of all those calls to false worship, and here's the call to true worship. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. What is this angel saying? Remember, an angel is just a messenger. That's all the word means. It's a messenger. Verse 7, Fear God, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and, what's the next word, everyone? Worship. But who are we supposed to worship? Read the rest of the verse. Worship him that, what was that word we were going to remember? Made. Worship him that made. Notice this. The heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Now let that sink in. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Worship who? Him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. In other words, in the last days, there's a call back to worship God as the creator. Now go back to Exodus chapter 20 and tell me if you see any similarities here. Exodus in the 20th chapter. Notice verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that in them is. Does that sound familiar, yes or no? It's virtually an identical quote. So John, at the end of time, when he says, you got to worship the true God, well, how do we know who the true God is? He's the creator God that made all heaven and earth and made the Sabbath. That's the one you want to worship. Now, beloved, this is some incredible stuff. Think this through. God here, remember, there's 798,000 words in the Bible. God wrote about 300 of them. If you're a mathematician and you work that out as a percentage, it comes out to 0.00266%. So approximately one three hundredth of a percent is the number of words that God wrote in the Bible. The rest of the words were written by God's friends, and certainly he inspired them. Can you say Amen. But when it came time to actually write the Ten Commandments, God said, Moses, you are not qualified. And God condescended and took it upon himself to write on his, on, with his own finger on tables of stone. And right in the middle of those commandments is this remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now the rest of the commandments, number five, honor thy father and thy mother. Number six, thou shalt not kill. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And number ten, thou shalt not covet. Now, have you ever noticed that eight of the ten commandments are all framed in the negative? Have you noticed that? Eight of the ten commandments begin like this. Thou shalt not. Don't do this. The theologians call this commandments of omission. 
Omit this behavior from your repertoire. Omit the behavior of adultery. Omit the behavior of killing. Take that out of your behavior patterns. But there are two commandments that the theologians call commandments of commission. In other words, not to omit a behavior, but to add or commit a behavior. And both of those commandments are the only two commandments framed in the positive. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. These are the only two commandments that are framed in the positive. This is the simplest way I can put it. A corpse can keep eight of the Ten Commandments. Did you get that? A cadaver can keep eight of the Ten Commandments because they're all framed in the negative. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. A corpse has no problem. Corpse doesn't steal. Corpse doesn't kill. Corpse doesn't commit adultery. Are you with me on this? But if you're a living, breathing, active, dynamic individual, you can keep the fourth commandment to remember God's Sabbath and the fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother. Can you say amen? amen. Now, God wrote all these things down with his finger. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the two commandments that have to do with our creator are framed in the positive. The first one is our true heavenly creator, and he says, keep my Sabbath. And then the fifth commandment is our procreators, our parents. He says, you better honor them. Well, let's continue on with our study here because it is really quite incredible. When we go to Ezekiel chapter 20, we find this incredible passage. Verse 20, Ezekiel 20, 20. He's speaking and he says to the children of Israel, hallow my Sabbaths. Now, there's that word again, hallow. What does it mean, everyone? Make it holy. Keep it holy. Hallow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. A sign. The Sabbaths are a sign. Let that sink in. What are they a sign of? This is real simple. How many of you have a friend that is not a Christian? Raise your hand. You have a, you have a friend or two that just don't happen to be a Christian. Good. Let me ask you a question. If somebody chooses to keep, let's say, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, does that mean they're a Christian? Yes or no? Could a Buddhist keep the seventh commandment? Sure. Why not? Now, let me ask you this. Do you maybe have non-Christian friends that don't kill? You hope so, right? In other words, listen very carefully. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Many of the commandments can be kept by Buddhists. But you want to know what's interesting? You come to that fourth commandment. And the fourth commandment says, worship the creator God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rest on the seventh day. That commandment tells people who you're worshiping. Are you with me on that? See, that commandment sets it aside. If you say, I keep the seventh-day Sabbath in honor of the Creator God, they immediately know who you're talking about. Are you with me on that? If you just choose to refrain from adultery, that doesn't tell anybody who you worship. If you just choose to not kill, that doesn't tell anybody who you worship. There is a commandment, though, that makes it very clear. This is the God I'm worshiping. I rest on the seventh day because God did. I'm worshiping the God of creation. Are you understanding this, yes or no? So God says it's a sign. All of the other heathen nations that were surrounding Israel, they didn't keep the seventh-day Sabbath. They didn't worship the Creator God. They worshiped the God of the frogs, the dogs, the hogs, and the pollywogs. Are you with me now? But the Israelites worshiped the Creator God. There's a difference, a big difference. Now, notice what he says in verse 12. Moreover, and I need you to... Do you have your thinking caps with you, ladies? Reach into the purse, put the thinking cap on. Men, if you brought it, reach out of the wallet, put it on, because this is some incredible stuff. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths. Notice whose Sabbaths they are. He says they're my Sabbaths. To be a sign between me and them. He said, I thought we already read that. But notice the second part here. That they might know. Who's they? The people of God might know. That I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now, God is the only person who can sanctify anything. Can you say amen? Amen. See, God can make this thing holy. God can make this podium holy. God can make this projector holy. God can make this computer holy. God can make that seat holy. God can make this stage holy. And God can make this man holy. Are you understanding this? Yes or no? The Sabbath is a sign that God is the one who makes us holy. That's what he says. I'm the one that sanctifies you. You don't sanctify yourself. Now, let's unpack that. The Sabbath is a sign that it is God alone who can make us holy. Now, if you believe that, say amen. amen. Every Christian ought to believe that. If you don't, you believe in salvation by works. We don't make ourselves holy. We allow God to make us holy. He's in the business of making people holy. Notice the next one here. Our own works cannot make us holy. Can you say amen? amen. 
we must trust in and rest in God's work for us. Notice this. Therefore, the Sabbath is a sign of trusting totally in Christ's righteousness and not our own. Can you say amen? Now, let's unpack that a little bit. You see, God's holy seventh-day Sabbath is, number one, a sign and symbol of creation. He worked for six and rested on the seventh, right? That's what he did in creation. But more than that, it is a sign and symbol of salvation. That's what he said. I want you to keep the Sabbath so you can know that I'm the one who makes you holy. I'm the one who worked out the plan of salvation. I'm the one who sent my son to die on the cross. Now, you got those thinking caps on still? Let's talk about Adam. The first full day that Adam experienced was the Sabbath. Are you with me on that? Because Adam was created on the sixth day. Is this true, yes or no? Adam was created on the sixth day, and, and by the time that Adam was looking around, and here was Eve, and everything had been named, and the seventh day came on the scene, you want to know what? Creation was, what was that word I told you to put on a shelf? Finished. Creation was done, right? And then the first full day that Adam experiences, God says to Adam, Adam, we're going to rest. Rest? I'm not even tired. I know, but I made all of this for you. Look at how pretty this is. I just want to sit back with you and enjoy it. Now, here's the point. Can you imagine if Adam would have said, well, Lord, I'm not satisfied to rest. I want to make something. I want to add to your creation. So you get this picture in your mind of Adam going over there on the seventh day, and he stoops down, and he gets some mud together, and he tries to form a bird, right? And he's going to make a bird, and he has a bird now, and he starts blowing on this piece of dirt. It's going to make a bird, right? Wants to breathe into its nostrils the breath of life so it will live. Can Adam add anything to God's creation? No. All he can do is enjoy it. Are you understanding this, yes or no? Now make the obvious application. When it comes to salvation, I remember in John chapter 19 and verse 30, Jesus was on the cross. And he said something just before he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. You know what he said? He said, it is finished. What was finished? The sacrifice. The sacrificial offering had been made and the plan of salvation in terms of the sacrificial component was finished. Now, make the obvious application. You and I, can we add anything to the salvation that God has already worked out for us 2,000 years ago? You can't add anything. What are you going to add to it? All you can do is accept it and enjoy it. Can you say amen? Same thing Adam had to do with creation. He couldn't add anything to the creation. He couldn't make a dog. He, all he could do was enjoy the dogs that God made. He couldn't make a hippo. All he could do was enjoy the hippos that God had made. He couldn't make a tree. All he could do was enjoy the trees that God had made. You and I, we can't make our own salvation. We just enjoy the salvation he's done for us. You see, God has already worked. He's rested, and now you and I rest in Jesus. Can you say amen? See, that's what the Sabbath is all about. And if you want more information on this, read Hebrews chapter 4. Read Hebrews chapter 4. It's the whole passage is all about how the Sabbath is a sign that we're resting in Jesus. Now, let's continue. Who was it that made... I don't want to give it away. Who was it that made the hippopotamus? God made the hippopotamus. Who made the giraffe? Who made the seahorse? Now, you're giving me the right answer, but I want you to be more specific. Who was it specifically that made all the orange trees? I'm hearing mixed answers, so let's get the Bible answer. Go with me to John chapter 1. Very quickly, John in the first chapter. You know where that's at. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 1. Let's get the Bible answer. Who was it that made? You're saying God, and that is the correct answer, but you can answer with more uh, specificity if you would like. John chapter 1, and I'm reading in verse 1. John 1, 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. Now, who's the Word? Anybody know? Jesus. Jump down to verse 14. And the Word became what, everyone? Flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this Word is Jesus. Are we all clear on that? Yes or no? Notice verse 2. Verse 2 says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. How many things were made through Him? Who's Him? Good. All things were made through Jesus. And without Him, who's Him? Jesus. Nothing was made that was made. Notice verse 10. Verse 10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made 
through him, and the world did not know him. So let's answer the question now from the Bible. Who was it that created the hippopotamus? It was Jesus. And the, 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 the actually scripturally accurate answer is this. God created it through the conduit of Jesus. God created it through the mechanism of Jesus. If you want to scribble down a couple more texts, write down Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. And write down Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. God created through Jesus. So Jesus is the creator. Are you with me on that? So who created the seahorses? Who was it? Who created the hippopotamus? Who created the blue whale? Who created the grass? Who created the Sabbath? You got it. You got the right answer, man. You see, to get the whole point, who was it in the beginning that created? It was Jesus. Then who was it in the beginning that rested? Jesus. Well, that raises a good question. By the way, before I go one second further, let me show you what is unquestionably one of the greatest statements of Christian orthodoxy that we know of, okay? So everybody here that's, say, from the Calvinistic tradition, and you're, you might align yourself with the CRC or maybe with the Presbyterians, you, very strong into orthodoxy, and I love that. I respect that. Listen very carefully. This is some powerful stuff. The apostolic creed is considered by many to be one of the grandest statements of orthodox Christianity known. In other words, this is the mainline stuff. This is what all Christians are supposed to believe. Let's unpack it. O Lord Almighty, thou hast created the world by who? Does the Bible teach that? Yes or no? Yes. Amen. Notice the next part. And has appointed the Sabbath in memory thereof. Isn't that incredible? In other words, that's as orthodox as you can get. That is orthodoxy in the extreme. God created everything through Jesus, and he gave the Sabbath as a sign of it. Well, that raises a question. If Jesus created the Sabbath as a divine God, then how did he, as a human man, treat the Sabbath? And for that answer, we go to the book of Luke. You're in John? Go to the book immediately preceding John. Luke, chapter 4. He created it as God. How did he treat it as man? Luke in the fourth chapter. Luke chapter 4, and you are noticing with me verse 16. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. The Bible says, So he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. I'm in Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to what? Read. Now, notice it says that Jesus, as a man, kept a custom. What was his custom? This particular custom was to go into the synagogue on the what day? Yeah. Sabbath day. Now, if you wanted to find Jesus, let's say you live back in the days of ancient Palestine, and you're looking for Jesus. You've got to tell Jesus something. You have a message from his mother, maybe, and you've got to tell Jesus something very important. You've got to get this message to him, and it's, it's Sabbath. Would you go to the carpenter shop? You could go there, but you'd find the saw was on the table. No Jesus. Would you go out into the field? You could go out into the field, but you'd find that the horses and all the various animals that they used to do the plowing are back at the house. You wouldn't find Jesus in the field. If you wanted to find Jesus and it was the Sabbath, where'd you go? You'd go to church. You'd go to the synagogue. And you'd find him in there. Why? Well, that was his custom. I wonder why it was his custom. Well, because he had established it in creation and he had commanded it at Mount Sinai. So it would only stand to reason that he would keep it while he was on this earth. Can you say amen? We would expect that. Now, one of Jesus' favorite things to call himself was the Son of Man. By the way, that term is taken from Daniel chapter 7, if you're interested. It's a Danielic term. And in Matthew 12, 8, 12, 8 and Mark 2, 28, and Luke 6, 5, we find this statement in all of the three synoptic gospels. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the what? Sabbath. See, he says, I'm the Lord of the hippopotamus, I'm the Lord of the Nile, I'm the Lord of the earth, I'm the Lord of the sky, I'm the Lord of the rain, I'm the Lord of the fig tree, and I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He says it again in Mark 2, 28. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the what, everyone? The Sabbath. Luke 6, 5. The Son of Man is Lord of the what, everyone? Sabbath. He wants you to know that. He's saying, I was the creator God. And many of Jesus' most important miracles that he performed in the entirety of his ministry were performed on the Sabbath. Do you want to know why? Because the Sabbath is all about the benefit of mankind. You see, it's hard to give God honor, praise, glory, and adoration when your body is riddled with leprosy. And so Jesus would find a leper, and many times on the Sabbath, just to prove how 
beautiful the Sabbath was, Jesus would heal somebody right on the Sabbath. And all the religious leaders would say, what are you doing? You're breaking our traditions. And he'd say, I'm not here to talk about traditions. I'm here to talk about the commandment of God. And the Sabbath was made for the benefit of man. Can you say amen? And so Jesus was taking the Sabbath, and he was whoosh, tearing it away from all of those silly traditions that they had wrapped it up in. They had some funny ones, too. I could go into the history of where all those traditions came from, but to make a long story short, they'd been in Babylonian captivity, and they didn't ever want to go back into Babylonian captivity. That was Judah. Israel was in Assyrian captivity. They said, Whoa. after they got out of captivity, we don't want to go back in there again. How can we be sure that idolatry will never come back within the confines of Israel? Ah, we'll hedge ourselves around with all of these traditions so there's no way that idolatry can creep in. And what happened was is that they kept the letter of the law, but they neglected the spirit. And so they'd say really funny things. Like if it was the Sabbath day, you couldn't spit. You want to know why? Because you were irrigating. That was work. If it was the Sabbath day, you couldn't walk more than a, a short distance to go to another place. Maybe it was a quarter mile or a half a mile. But they had another tradition that said wherever you eat, that's your home. And so on the day before the Sabbath, if people wanted to go a long distance, sometimes what they do is they'd go out and they would stash a little piece of bread under a rock about a quarter mile away. Then they'd go another quarter mile and they'd stash a little piece of bread and another quarter mile and they'd stash a piece of bread. And so when the Sabbath came, they could walk that Sabbath day's journey a quarter mile. Oh, sit down and here's a piece of bread. And they could eat. And because Jewish tradition said, well, this is now your home. You're eating here. Well, I can go another Sabbath day's journey. And they'd walk to the next piece of bread. Oh, look, another piece of bread. And they'd sit. Can you imagine now, that's some crazy stuff, isn't it? They had another one that said, you can't pick up anything heavier than an olive unless it's attached to you. So they would, they would take things and sew it to their garments. Heavy things. They would sew them to their garments so that they would have their, their Sabbath outfit so they could have all these things sewed to themselves because you couldn't pick it up because it was working. Now, that is some funny stuff. Don't you agree, yes or no? You won't find anything about that in the Bible. You won't find any of that silliness in the Bible. See, Jesus wanted the people to know, I made the Sabbath to be a blessing to you. I made the Sabbath so you could come and worship me. I made the Sabbath to be the best day of the week, not a burden. In fact, on one occasion, Jesus actually said, he said, the Sabbath was made for, what's that next word there? Man. I've been reading in Mark 2, 27, and not man for the Sabbath. Now, let's unpack that a little bit. The Sabbath was made for man. By the way, the Greek word that is translated man there is anthropos. Anthropos. From whence we derive our word anthropology. Now, what is the study of anthropology? It's the study of man. You got it. That's it. And woman. Right, ladies? Mankind or womankind. The Sabbath was made for man. In other words, the Sabbath was made for man's benefit. Not man for the Sabbath. In other words, it goes like this. God didn't create the Sabbath and say, well, I got this old day. I better do something with it. I'll make a man to enjoy it. Didn't work that way. God first created man, and then he gave him a blessing. Can you say amen? So that's what you find. Jesus created it as God, and he worshiped on it in his life and in his death. Now, this is where it gets awesome. Open your Bible. You're in Luke, I think, still. Look at Luke chapter 23. Now, you want to talk about some awesome stuff? I hope those thinking caps are still on because this gets really good. Luke chapter 23. Don't you just love studying the Bible? Luke chapter 23, and I'm reading in verse 50. Luke 23 and verse 50. You know that Luke 23 is the chapter in which Jesus was crucified. Luke 23. And in verse 50, the Bible says, Now there was a man named, what was his name, everyone? Joseph. I'm in Luke 23, 50. A council member, a good and a just man. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the what? What did he want? He wanted the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever laid before. Verse 54 says, That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Let that sink in. The day that Jesus was crucified was the preparation and the Sabbath was coming closer. You with me? Notice verse 25. And the women who came with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Praise the Lord for ladies. Amen, men? I tell you, if I was in charge of decorating my house, it would be something. But my, the Lord has given women this sense. 
that, that, that decorative sense. They just want things to look nice. And that was the case even with Jesus' death. They didn't want any old ugly burial to satisfy for their Lord. And so the men had just taken him and laid him ingloriously in the tomb. But the ladies came down. They wanted to make sure it was just right. They wanted to be sure the body was laid in just the right way. They wanted to be sure that everything was done nice and neat and appropriate. And so the ladies come down and they begin the preparation of the embalming of the body of Jesus. They're, they're getting their work started, but they look at their Seikos and they realize the Sabbath is coming. We, we can't finish up this work on the Sabbath. And so notice what it says in verse 56. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the what, everyone? The Sabbath. And notice those next four words. According to the what? Commandment. What commandment? The fourth commandment. Now, here's the point. Jesus was crucified on the preparation day. And you got it. He was crucified on the preparation day and they went down to put the body into the tomb and they started laying it, but they saw, oh, the Sabbath is coming. And so they went back and they rested on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus must have really loved the Sabbath. Jesus must have really taught his disciples the importance of the Sabbath because now they've spent three and a half years with him and even the burial of their own Lord was not sufficient excuse to break one of its tenants. Wow, Jesus must have taught them good. The Sabbath was an important day for God and family. And so they go back to, pre to prepare the spices and the ointments and then to rest on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. That must have been a very sad day. But then the first day of the week came around. The Sabbath was done. And you know what's going to happen, right? they got to go finish their job. The job they started on the preparation day, they didn't do it on the Sabbath, so they're going back to finish their job. And hallelujah, we read in verse 1 of chapter 24, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, I like that, they were anxious to get back there. And certain Mary and certain other women, it says, came with them to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. Hallelujah for verses 2 and 3. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Can you say amen, Christian? Amen. Note of verse 7. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day, what's going to happen? Rise again. Now let's unpack this. This is real simple. You don't even have to have your thinking cap on for this one. The preparation day was the day that Jesus was crucified and put in the tomb. This has traditionally been called Good Friday. Right? Are you with me on that? And then the next day was what day? The Sabbath day. And that would be what we would call Saturday. And notice this one. Sunday is the first day of the week. We call that Easter what? Sunday. Very, very significant. Now let the, let the importance of this rest into your mind for just a moment here. By the way, if you want to take a look at that word Saturday, it, if you look it up in the dictionary, it will simply say this, the seventh day of the week. You with me on that? The seventh day of the week. Now, the important day, remember, is the seventh day. That's what God told us in Genesis. Now, think about something. God had created one day, two day, three day, four day, five day, six days. He created all six days. What did he do on that seventh day? What did he do, everyone? Why did he rest? Because it was finished. Are you with me on that? Now, Jesus has just cried out on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And then he says, it is, what does that say in John 19, 30? Yeah. Finished. And then you know what Jesus does? He does in salvation the same thing he did in creation. He rests on the Sabbath. Can you say amen? amen. That is incredible. He rested on the Sabbath in creation and he rests on the Sabbath in salvation. He could have picked any day to be in the tomb. He could have picked Wednesday. Could have picked Thursday. He said, no. I'm going to rest on the Sabbath. In fact, if you go to 108 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. I have some Spanish friends, and when I see them on the Sabbath, I don't say, Happy Sabbath. I say, Feliz Sabado. Sabado. That's their word for Saturday. Am I right? Am I right, friends? That's right, isn't it? That's the word. See, in our language, we got two words. It's confusing. We got Saturday, which comes from the, it's a pagan thing, Saturn. And we got Monday for the moon. And we got Thursday for the god Thor. And we got Sunday for the day of the sun. See, these are all pagan names. But in most cultures, 108 languages, when you say the seventh day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, when you say Friday, Saturday, you're actually saying Sabbath. Si feliz sábado in español. My wife is Romanian. She was born in Romania and raised there. And if I go to a Romanian church 
and I'm there on the Sabbath and I'm preaching, you know what I say? I say, Sabbat Ferechit. Happy Sabbath. Sabbat. That's the seventh day. No question in my mind what day the seventh day is, and there was no question in Jesus' mind. But what about in the New Testament? Some people say, oh, sure, Jesus kept the Sabbath. He was a Jew. You want to know what's interesting, though? The New Testament disciples kept the Sabbath, too. Every one of them. Paul kept it. Peter kept it. James kept it. Barnabas kept it. Mary kept it. Luke kept it. Martha kept it. Every single person after the resurrection of Jesus kept the Sabbath. And notice this. This is one example. Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. It says, They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 2. Then Paul, and notice these next words, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. That's what Jesus' custom was, wasn't it? Remember, if you wanted to find Jesus and it was Saturday, where Sabbath, where'd you go? Went to the synagogue. What if you wanted to find Paul? Don't go to the tent shop. Remember, Paul was a tent maker. You could go there on the Sabbath, but all the needles and the canvas would be just laying there. You had to go to the church if you wanted to find him on the Sabbath. And there are so many incidents. Let me show you one real quick. Just two minutes. Just suffer me for two minutes. Go with me to Acts chapter 13. I wasn't planning on doing this, but you're going to love this. Acts in the 13th chapter. Acts chapter 13, and I am reading from verse 14. Some people say, oh, no, 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 Dave, you missed it. You missed it. In the New Testament, Paul changed the day. It used to be Sabbath, but now it's a new day. Let's see if that's really true. Acts chapter 13, and notice with me verse 13. It says, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went down into the synagogue on the what day? Sabbath day and sat down. Now that's what you'd expect. Verse 15 says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation to the people, say on. In other words, what happened was Paul went into church and sat down. Somebody stands up to do the scripture reading and. Is that Paul? Paul, is that you? Yeah, it's me. Why don't you preach the sermon? That's what happened, basically. Paul, you come up. You got anything you want to say? You come up here. And Paul preaches a powerful sermon. It's right there. The whole thing is basically recorded in Acts chapter 13. Just pick up the first part of it. Verse 16. Then Paul stood up in motion with his hand saying, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with them, with an uplifted arm, he brought them out. And so he is preaching powerfully. Notice verse 26. We're just going to look at the highlights of this sermon. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to the word of this salvation has been sent. To you the word of this salvation has been sent. So notice that he's preaching salvation. What is he preaching, everyone? He's preaching salvation. Now notice this. It gets even better. Verse 36. Verse 36. For David, now this is still Paul's sermon, after he had served his generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw no corruption. Verse 37, but he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Who would that be? The one that God raised up? Jesus. So he's preaching salvation and he's preaching the resurrection. Are you with me on this so far? Yes or no? He's preaching salvation. He's preaching the resurrection. Pure power. This is the kind of sermon you love to hear. Verse 38, therefore let it be known to you men, you brethren, through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Wow. This is a great sermon, isn't it? He's preaching salvation. He's preaching the resurrection. He's preaching the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that the kind of stuff you love to hear? Can you say amen? amen? In other words, Paul's preaching a good old-fashioned gospel sermon. What day of the week is he preaching it, by the way? He's preaching it on the Sabbath. Man, this must have been a good sermon. Let's, let's jump down to verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Wow, that really must have been a good sermon. See, the Gentiles weren't allowed into the inner temple of the court while the Jews were in there. And so the Gentiles are standing at the door. They liked the sound of that. sounded good. And when they saw all the Jews file out, then the Gentiles went in and said, Paul, that was a dynamic sermon. We want you to preach that same sermon to us next week. Now, who's he talking to at this point? Who's Paul talking to? Gentiles. How many of you tonight here are Gentiles? In other words, you're not the legitimate descendants of Abraham. You got. So most of us here are Gentiles. Now, if there was ever a time in the Scriptures for Paul to say, but you don't have to come back next week, I'll see you here tomorrow on the new day of worship. 
You follow me? He's talking to Gentiles now. All he would have had to say is, no, fellas, you don't have to wait for a week. The new day of worship is Sunday. You come back tomorrow and I'll preach you the same sermon. But notice what the Bible says. Verse 43, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Can you say amen? So Jews and Gentiles kept the Sabbath. In fact, let me make a statement here that is incredible. Every single follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob kept the Sabbath. Every one. Adam kept the Sabbath. Moses kept the Sabbath. Isaiah kept the Sabbath. Jeremiah kept the Sabbath. Ezekiel kept the Sabbath. Ruth kept the Sabbath. All through the entirety of the Old Testament, Daniel kept the Sabbath. Hosea kept the Sabbath. Zechariah kept the Sabbath. Malachi kept the Sabbath. Let's go into the New Testament. Matthew kept the Sabbath. Mark kept the Sabbath. Luke, John kept the Sabbath. Let's continue to go. Mary kept the Sabbath. Martha kept the Sabbath. John on the island of Patmos kept the Sabbath. Oh, John the Baptist kept the Sabbath. Every one of them. Paul kept the Sabbath. Barnabas kept the Sabbath. We could go on. Timothy kept the Sabbath. Every single follower of God in the entire Bible kept the Sabbath. Can you say amen? Well, of course, that would be expected. Well, let's wrap this thing up. The Sabbath is all about Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. Now, I'm going to give you the six reasons that I keep the Sabbath. Are you ready? Here they are. I find this evidence very compelling, and I am not ashamed of it. I keep God's seventh-day Sabbath because he commanded it. Amen? Now, watch this. I'm going to give you six reasons. You tell me if you find these reasons compelling. Be honest with yourself. Number one, I keep the Sabbath because Jesus in the beginning created it. Can you say Amen. Number two, I keep the Sabbath because Jesus at Mount Sinai commanded it with his own finger on tables of stone. Number three, I keep the Sabbath because Jesus in his life worshipped on it. And it's always safe to do what Jesus did. When in doubt, do what Jesus did. Number four, I keep the Sabbath because Jesus, even in his death, observed it. Number five, I keep the Sabbath because Jesus in his church continued it. And number six, I keep the Sabbath because Jesus in Revelation says his people will keep it. Now, I find these reasons compelling, and so I personally choose to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. Despite the overwhelming evidence, many Christians insist that the Bible teaches Sunday observance. Let me go on record right here telling, I'm just going to be straight with you right now. There are only about eight times in the entire Bible that the first day of the week is mentioned. Eight times. And the only ones that are really used to try to prove Sunday observance are these three texts right here. You want to write those down. You'll want to do that if you're interested. John chapter 20 and verse 19, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 3, and Acts 20, 6 to 11. If you go ask your pastor, I, I can almost guarantee you he's going to go to one of those texts. These are the texts that are used. In other words, if you can't find it there, you're not going to find it. Let's take a look at just the first two, just like that, real quick. Real quick, we're almost done. Very quickly, John chapter 20. Some people say, no, nope. the day of the week was changed in John chapter 20. And we're reading in verse 19. John chapter 20 and verse 19, it says, John chapter 20 and verse 19, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. Now, what day would that be? That'd be Sunday. When the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled. They say, there it is. You see it? The disciples are worshiping on the first day of the week. The problem is there's no period there. There's a comma. And you know what a comma means, right? It means pause and then read the rest. And the rest of it says this, where they were assembled for fear of the Jews. Ha! They were afraid. Why? Because Mary had told them that the body of Jesus was missing and they didn't believe in the resurrection yet. You know, they, they don't even believe the resurrection's happened yet in this verse. They don't believe it until the end of the verse when Jesus comes and says, Peace be with you. And then they suddenly stop knocking their knees together and start praising God. Are you with me on that? So if you wanted to keep Sunday according to that verse, what you'd have to do is go in your closet. Because that's what they were doing. There's no command. They were afraid. They were afraid of what was going to happen to them. And so they're afraid and they're in this closet scared. And brothers and sisters, you, there, there's nothing there about keeping a new day. Now, how about one, one more, just real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. By the way, who wrote the most in the New Testament? Which author wrote the most in the New Testament? Paul. 
Paul. We're going to 1 Corinthians 16. And do you want to know, in the whole voluminous writings of Paul, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, in all the writings of Paul, all of those epistles to all of those churches dealing with all of those struggles and problems, do you want to know how many times Paul mentions the first day of the week? Anybody have a guess? One time. One time. Must not have been that important. One time. And we're going to read it right here. If we don't find it here, we're not going to find it. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, notice verse 1. Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. Galatia's taken up an offering. I want you to take up an offering in Corinth. Verse 2. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Verse 3. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. Anything in there about a worship service? Nope. What's happening here? Simple. The saints in Jerusalem were in a famine. They were in a famine, and they were struggling. And so Paul, on his missionary journeys, was taking up offerings to help the saints out. He says, hey, I've already taken up a great big offering in Galatia, and I'd like to take up an offering in Corinth, and this is what I want you to do. I want you on the first day of the week. Now, why did he say the first day of the week? Because that was the first day they'd be back working. See, the first day of the week is the first day of the work week. And they would have been back working and, and seeing how God had prospered them and preparing for the work that coming week. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to take what you can offer, take your offerings and your alms, and lay them aside so that when I come, you don't have to be, you know, running here and running there trying to get everything together. You can just give me the offering and I can make my way through rapidly. Nothing about a worship service, nothing about church, nothing. Paul just says, hey, first day of the week when you're getting everything together, getting your offerings and all that, lay some aside for the people in Jerusalem so when I come through, I can whoosh, pick it up real quick. Now, beloved, that's the only place in the whole Bible that Paul even mentions the first day of the week, and there is nothing there about a change in the commandment, nothing about a worship service, and certainly nothing about doing away with the Sabbath. Can you say Amen. Well, there's only one left, and you can study that on your own. It's just as easy. Now, let me make a very radical statement. I'll have you out of here by 8.30. Let me make a radical statement. You're going to say, hmm, who is this guy? If you can show me one text, one text in the Bible that says that we should keep Sunday, first come, first serve, I'll write you a check for $5,000. That's fair. That's fair. In fact, I'll give you $5,000 for every text. So you get two, that's $10,000. You get three, that's fifteen. dollars You can ask your pastor. You can ask your mom. You can ask your dad. You can, anybody, ask them. The deal stands. Now, before you get too excited and think you're going to make this preacher poor, <laughs> I've done this in every city I've ever been in and have not yet written the check. But I, I leave it open, and I mean it. I mean this with all my heart. I'm not just whistling Dixie up here. I mean it. You produce one text, I'll write you a check. I'll do it publicly right here on this platform. I mean that seriously. The point is just this, beloved. The text is not there. Jesus points to the seventh day. Who changed the Bible Sabbath? God didn't do it. Who changed it? Jesus didn't do it. Who changed it? The disciples didn't do it. Well, then who did it? Who changed it? And we read. Daniel 7, 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. We have already identified this power as the Roman church state. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And according to the book of Revelation, there will be two calls to worship and two claims on authority. Two calls to worship, two claims on authority. Two calls to worship. You know, you and I today are just like those people that were standing outside of the judgment hall in the days of Jesus. And there was Pilate, and there was Jesus. Rome, and Jesus. And Pilate said, what should I do with Jesus? And the crowd said, you crucify him. And he said, well, well why should I crucify him? He claims to be the king of the Jews. Why should I crucify him? He's done no evil. They said, we don't have any king but Caesar. And everybody had a decision to make that day. And you know what the decision was? Are you going to stand in the unpopular position of being on the side of Jesus? Or are you going to take the easy road and go with Rome? 
And everybody that was standing in that audience had to make a decision. They had to say Jesus or Rome. And you know what they chose, don't you? Most of them chose Rome. Beloved, we will be faced with that same decision. We repeat from the Catholic doctrine as defined by the Council of Trent. Tradition, not Scripture, is the rock on which the church of Jesus Christ is built. Tradition. One last statement from the question box. In keeping Sunday, non-Catholics are simply following the practice of the Catholic Church for 1,800 years, a tradition, and not a Bible ordinance. Rome or Jesus. Now, my wife and I have already talked about this. We've made up our minds. We've prayed about it. And we have decided that for our house, we're going to serve the Lord. We made up our minds. By His grace, we will serve Him. And today, I know this has been new for a whole lot of you. And you might be stirred up right now, just mad at that little preacher. <laughs> Beloved, I didn't tell you this to embarrass you, and I didn't tell this to make you mad. I told it to you because the Bible teaches it. And I am duty-bound not just to preach. I, I can't just preach to you the things that will make you my friends. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I, I'm not under authority from God just to tell you what you want to hear. i got to tell you what the Bible says. You say, but I never heard this before. Well, shame on those preachers. <laughs> Beloved, i got to tell you what the Bible says. Now, I could be wrong tonight. And if I'm wrong, I want you to show me from the Bible. Because I'm, this is the foundation right here. If it's in here, I believe it. How about you? If it's in here, I'm going to follow it. How about you? Now, I could be wrong, but you better show me from the Bible. You can't show me from the Bible, and I'm not interested. You come and say, well, my dad said, not interested. Well, my pastor told me, not interested. Well, my church, not interested. I want to hear what the Bible has to say. Are you with me on this, yes or no? Now, beloved, is that fair, yes or no? After all, notice what you came to. You came to a Bible prophecy seminar. Are you with me on that? This is all about the Bible. And tonight I know that this has been sharp for some of you and the surgeon has that scalpel firmly in hand, but I just want to affirm you. Jesus Christ loves you tonight with all of his heart. Jesus Christ has a plan for you. Jesus Christ brought you to these meetings. And Jesus Christ today introduced this to you because he loves you. Amen. You've been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International copyright 2003, American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. For additional cassettes or CDs by the speaker or for a free catalog of other American Cassette Ministry cassettes, please contact us as follows. To order toll free in the United States and Canada, dial 800-233-4450. For international calls, dial 717-652-7000. For fax orders, dial 717-652-9050. Our internet email address is info at americancassette.org. Other cassettes and CDs may also be ordered from our secure website at www.americancassette.org.